These are the teams of Pokemon Crystal's Elite Four and Champion. Do you notice anything about these teams? Well, not only are they kind of bad, but they are the exact same teams as the ones used in Gold and Silver. Game Freak had an opportunity to fix these sad, sad teams, and yet despite that, Crystal changed nothing. Fortunately for us though, we have mod tools, and today we're gonna do what Game Freak never did. We are going to make fun, challenging, and thematically appropriate teams for Crystal's Elite Four and champion. So we're gonna do this in order, and that means starting with Will. Now, unlike some characters, Will was actually introduced in Gen 2, and since there was already a Psychic Gym Leader in Gen 1, I feel like his team should have focused on the new Psychic Pokemon of Gen 2. Like, Jinx was already in the Gen 1 Elite Four, and in our game, we're putting it on Price's team, so I think that calls for an easy removal. Executor also saw a lot of play in Gen 1, and factoring in both its bad typing and inability to cover darks, it just doesn't do anything for the team. Also, like, did you really need a second Zatu when there are four other Gen 2 Psychics that could have filled that role? No, you didn't. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Will's new and improved team. Also, this is a subscription checkpoint, and if you don't hit it, you may never get to play against this team yourself. But Will is now going to start with a lead Girafferic that knows Psychic, Rock Smash, Agility, and Baton Pass. There are not a lot of useful Baton Pass users in Gen 2, so I thought this could be a fun potential setup for Will. More importantly, though, Girafferic helps mitigate risk from ghost types. Now next up, we're going to see a Pokemon I can't believe didn't make it to this team, and that is Slowking. It's going to have Surf and Psychic for stab coverage along with Amnesia. But seeing as bugs have been buffed in this ROM hack, it's going to have Flamethrower, which is learned via Move Tutor, to cover bugs. Now next is Espeon, which I can only assume didn't make the team because they wanted to save it for red. Um, that's just, it's, it's really stupid. Will is going to run an Espeon. Espeon is good because of its really high speed and special attack, but with its limited move pool, it basically exists to land big psychics. Now, fourth and maybe surprising to some people will be his trusty Slowbro returning. It'll be equipped with Curse, Psychic, Body Slam, and Rock Smash for dark coverage. Now, you may be finding this to be a weird choice, but I promise it makes a lot of sense. Despite playing an extremely important role in the Gen 2 storyline, Slowpoke, Slowbro, and especially Slowking got very little admiration. They're an incredibly powerful Powerful line, and both feel deserving of a spot on Will's team. On top of providing dark and bug coverage, this also helps to keep in line with Will having two of the same Pokemon. Except in this case, they're actually slightly different and are much, much better than a Zatu with Quick Attack. But now, speaking of Zatu, this has an always sort of Will feel like Will's ace, so we're gonna leave it like that. Except now, on top of Psychic and Confuse Ray, we've given Zatu Recover and the Breeding Move Drill Peck. The ROM hack that we're making is going to include all Dark types available in Johto, and so overall, this is a team that is now more equipped to handle the Dark types you will bring into this fight. Also, lots of big psychic damage. Now, next up is Koga, whose team is in need of massive fixes. Ariados is so bad that I have moved it to feature on Bugsy's new team, so we can just scrap it here, and instead, Koga is going to lead with a quick claw fortress that knows Protect, Toxic, Explosion, and Spikes. And yeah, it, it might wreck your day, but it just feels really appropriate for Koga. Now, next, replacing his Ariados as his second Pokemon in line is actually going to be Tentacruel. Now, it might seem, at first, a little off-brand, but think about it. Koga has been promoted to the Elite Four. If we want that to feel believable, you've kind of got to assume that he did that by improving his team. I'm sorry, but running four coughing like his Gen 1 version just isn't gonna cut it when you get to the big leagues. Tentacruel provides amazing coverage with Surf and Ice Beam against Fire and Ground Pokemon that used to stomp him so badly. It's a great special wall, it fills his team, and is a worthy spot for a Pokemon that just got such little attention in Gen 1. I didn't want to change too much for Koga though, so out next is the legendary Muck with Minimize, Acid Armor, Sludge Bomb, and Toxic. Second last will be the newly buffed Venomoth with Leech Life, Psychic, Sludge Bomb, and Sleep Powder. And finally, he's gonna finish it up with a Poison Barb Crobat, knowing Double Team, Toxic, Wing Attack, and now finally, ladies and gentlemen, you are about to hear me right. Sludge Bomb. Gen 2 Crobat could not learn Sludge Bomb. That has been changed, and Koga gets it. Now, at position 3, Bruno is an Elite 4 member that has certainly got better from Gen 1 to 2. But the closer you look at his team, the, the, the worse it is. His Hitmontop was previously pathetic, with no fighting moves, and since it's now on Chuck's team, we've gone ahead and removed it from Bruno's. Hitmonchan will now be Bruno's lead, and it's had a huge makeover. While the elemental punches provide good coverage, its bad special attack made these moves useless, so instead 
Instead, it'll now be rocking the single Thunder Punch to cover flyers along with normal type Mega Punch, that's a bit of a Gen 1 callback, Priority Mach Punch, and the devastating Dynamic Punch. Like, come on, I, I get that it's Chuck's special move, but they really just went out here and didn't give the punching Pokemon the strongest punch in the game. Now, Hitmonlee was always a staple of this team and is his third slot, now knowing Headbutt, Curse, Foresight, and High Jump Kick. But a very exciting addition to this team in his second slot is Heracross. Game Freak had Bugsy, Chuck, and Bruno to add this on a team, and it didn't make it to a single trainer in the entire game. This is a certified Game Freak Gen 2 moment, and we're finally going to rectify it. For me, Heracross feels best to wait to feature on Bruno's team instead of Chuck. Heracross is just really awesome, and I think it hits better to reveal this guy in the Elite Four. It also just makes sense that Bruno would have sought out the most powerful fighters and in doing so eventually ran into one. Now learning Cross Chop, Earthquake, Takedown, and Megahorn, this is the perfect psychic counter that he was always searching for. Also, um, a lot of people memed on the fact that in Gen 1 he had two Onyx, but I always felt that this made sense, at least on paper. I always figured the Onyx served to counter flyers while also fitting a certain vibe of his team. Like, it's believable that Bruno and his team would roll with literal snake rocks to get stronger. The only reason I don't like Onyx here is simply because it's bad. It was bad when you fought it in the first ever Pokemon gym, so why bring this to the Elite Four? But fortunately for Gen 2, Onyx got an evolution, and it makes perfect sense to give Bruno a Steelix. Going from punching rocks to steel feels like a sensical jump into training regimen, and Steelix is really good. Still typing with Crunch beats Psychic and Ghost types, while Rock Slide can stick around for the Flyers. And lastly, Machamp must remain his top dog, but we've given it a black belt to cement it as the ace of the team. Okay, so good changes for a middling team. But if there is a trainer who screams unrecognized potential, that is going to be Karen. As a Dark-type user, her whole thing is using the Pokemon she likes rather than chasing power. The first problem with this, however, is that ethos doesn't line up with someone in her position. I get the emphasis of this game on wanting to use the Pokemon you like, but you would need, doesn't matter how much you like them, a strong team to make it here in the first place, which she does not have. Karen is just bad. Look at Umbreon, look at Murkrow, look at Vileplume, look at Gengar? She's so focused on coverage and weird utility moves that she just ends up lacking the gas to do any damage at all. Her two big underperformers were Murkrow with bad stats and Vileplume, which provides no useful coverage against her weakness to fighters and bugs. And with Umbreon as a defensive wall, this effectively meant that Gengar and Houndoom were left to be the attackers. And despite its incredible stats, Gengar's only damaging move is lick. Okay, look at this. Morty's Gengar, Gym 4. Karen's Gengar, Elite 4. Like, what was Game Freak thinking? Gengar just becomes a free kill for players, and from here, it's up to Houndoom to carry the damage output, and despite its very stellar moveset, it's little too late for the team as a whole. Fixing this is, fortunately, however, quite easy. Umbreon is a great Pokemon, it makes sense for the team, it can stay essentially unchanged. But we are going to give Gengar the Morty treatment, now rocking Shadow Ball, Confuse Ray, and a Hypnosis Dream Eater combo. Gengar should have been perfect for this team, and now it is. Because outside of fitting the team thematically, it can now serve its purpose of being a hard wall to fighting types. Now next up is Murkrow, who has seen an increase in base stats from 405 to 450. With little extra oomph, plus its egg move drill peck, Murkrow can now shine on her team as a secondary counter to fighters and a massive threat to bugs. Now, Houndoom will continue to hold the mantle as a solid fire dark mixed attacker, but rather than being Karen's ace, it becomes the right hand man to her true source of power, Tyranitar. Look, you can't make the pseudo-legendary of your region dark type and then not give it to the dark elite four member. Look, Gengar bothered me, but this is a crime. Tyranitar saw zero use in the entire original crystal, and I see no reason not to give Karen one. It ups her power massively and adds a huge piece of believability as to how she managed to make it to this place in the first place. This is the Karen you know now, and you must call her daddy. But ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for. How we fix 
Lance, the one true champion of the Johto Kanto region, Dragon Master, and Tamer of Birds. Okay, so the design philosophy for Lance is simple yet very effective. It's got some holes, but fortunately the solution to fixing those holes is also very simple. The explanation is complicated, however, so buckle up as we dive deep into this bird keeper. Rather than use complicated tactics, Lance's method of winning is simply to overwhelm his opponents with pure power. He has three 600 base stat dragons stacked with Thunder, Blizzard, and Fire Blast, and every single Pokemon on his team knows Hyper Beam. You, along with every youngster Joey and cool trainer in the region, are gonna go into this fight 10 levels lower than him, and you're lucky to have more than one move with 100 base power. Lance's design is very simple. It's just meant to overwhelm you with stats and moves completely out of your league. But in that design philosophy, Game Freak also wanted to add an out to this. They basically designed his team so that he would have a huge Achilles heel. Because despite Lance's daunting power, a single water ice type such as Lapras, Cloyster, Dugong, or even a Feraligator with Ice Punch can effectively dismantle five of his six Pokemon. His three dragons all fall to to a relatively low-powered Ice Punch or two, while both Aerodactyl and Charizard are sitting ducks for anything that knows Surf. And similarly, even his Gyarados is four times weak to Electric. Keen players might even seek to take advantage to Charizard's four times weakness to Rocks. So to put it plain and simple, Lance is a pure power-focused brute of a final boss with a gaping hole of weakness. Now, as a 12-year-old, I always felt like this was an exciting mechanic to take advantage of. This design philosophy really rewards the player by giving you this David versus Goliath experience. I want to get it out there that I, I see what Game Freak was doing, I respect it, but I think they missed the mark. I think they actually went a little bit too far with this design concept. Lance's weaknesses are simply too apparent and too abundant for him to be a threat to even my 12-year-old self let alone someone like you who is willing to watch through a video like this. And so my goal in fixing Lance is to make it so that he doesn't get swept by one Pokemon that knows an electric move and a water type with an ice move. I searched far and wide through the entire Gen 2 Pokedex and what I found was a little disappointing. The most obvious fix I see a lot of people make for Lance is to remove one Dragonite and simply give him Kingdra. Now, not only does this sort of dismantle the identity of Claire, um, Lance is a master of flying dragons. You can think of Claire as dragons of the sea, but Lance's team was built to be the master of the sky, and it would just be really weird to give him a sea dragon. Fortunately for us, however, there is one Pokemon that provides both the exact coverage we need and fits the guiding philosophy behind Lance's very meticulously, I should add, structured team. I know you're going to oppose this, but hear me out. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after a lot of time and effort, I would like to present to you my TED Talk as to why Lance should and always should have had the Bird of Thunder. To begin, the legendary birds are not obtainable and they do not appear in Gen 2. The places that they're in just aren't in Kanto anymore and that's because the games just couldn't fit them on the cartridge. So rather than having them just simply kind of be mysteriously gone, wouldn't it be cooler to add a really well-constructed storyline reason for that lack of appearance? Well, that's exactly where we begin with this, and, and it really all starts with Red. The Red that we fight at the top of Mount Silver is the player we were in the original games, and specifically in Pokemon Yellow, right? Like, Gen 2 is literally a storyline extension of the first game. And so if we were going to make a reason as to why the birds aren't in Gen 2, wouldn't the most logical explanation be is that they've already been caught by me and you, or in the context of Gen 2, they've already been caught by Red? Okay, so that at least makes sense enough for us to get the birds out of the wild and into the hands of a trainer. But next, let me explain how we get this bird to Lance. The theme of Pokemon, as you may or may not know, is to catch them all, and Red sought to obviously do that. Now, in doing so, Red would have sent a lot of his Pokemon to the PC. And despite catching tons of Pokemon, it's fair to assume that the team we see at the top of Mount Silver is his sort of 
standard team. It makes sense that we would see Red with his core team of the starters, Pikachu, and Snorlax. And I think that's really all you need for an explanation as to why Red would canonically have the birds, but not show them on his team. And so with all that, I, I think we could very easily take this a little bit further. Red is obviously a very smart Pokemon trainer, and maybe he was uncertain whether the legendary birds should be put into the PC system. Maybe he thought it would be wrong to leave such creatures without care. At the very least, Professor Oak probably would have suggested that they need to be studied, but given the fact that Red is focused on his own team, it's logical to think that he probably wasn't interested in taking care of them. Now, think about this. If Red was going to entrust a nearly extinct species of powerful birds to other trainers, he would need to put them in the hands of ones that are powerful. Now, first of all, we just looked at how incapable the Elite Four is, but I also just don't feel like a ninja, fighter, or psychic and dark user would feel equipped to handle these birds. So with that, I think Red would look to the other strongest trainers of Kanto. In that search, he would first turn to his near equal power and worthy rival, Blue. And Blue has shown an incredible aptitude of handling birds with the strongest Pidgeot in all of Johto and Kanto. So I think with that, it would be very fitting for Red to give Blue one of the birds to look after. And of course, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's the Blue Bird. It would, it would have to be Articuno. Now next, we have to give a reason as to why Lance shouldn't have Moltres. Moltres would be redundant with Charizard and it, it has to be Zapdos for Lance. Fortunately for us, there is a perfect trainer to take Moltres. So in Generation 1 on Cinnabar Island, there is a junior trainer who shares a story about Blaine. He tells the player about how Blaine was once lost in the mountains and a giant fiery bird led him to safety. And this inspired Blaine to become a fire type trainer. Moltres gets Blaine, it just makes perfect sense. And so lastly, if you've got a thunderous bird to take care of, who would you then give it to? Zapdos is the strongest of the three and would need a trainer capable of handling it. Someone who is used to giant amounts of power. Someone with a great understanding of flying beasts. None other than Bird Keeper Lights. And there you go, that is my very long-winded pitch an explanation as to why replacing his third Dragonite as a counter to water types, cementing him as the now worthy champion of Gen 2 is Champion Lance, complete with Gyarados, Charizard, Aerodactyl, Dragonite, Dragonite, and Zapdos.